All right, so we're still in the book of Galatians, and uh, we're going to read Galatians chapter 4, verses 17 through 31. All right. This is the Apostle Paul, obviously still writing. He's writing a letter to the Galatian churches. And the whole context behind the story, in case you're just joining us, I see a couple of faces that maybe haven't been with us is that the Apostle Paul, originally on his missionary journeys, had planted churches in the region of Galatia, and he had preached the, bi the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. He literally says it in the letter. He says, I, I preached the gospel in such a way that it was as though Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified before your very eyes. And the idea, really, in the original language is that it was almost like poster boards would have been pasted or plastered on, well, I mean, in modern day, uh, telephone poles. Kind of like the way that we would advertise a, a garage sale. The way that Paul preached the gospel, it was as though Jesus was publicly announced as crucified before them. But then on the back end, who, some people like, that scholars call Judaizers have come in. They're false they're, they're false brethren. It, get, it gets kind of gray when you really start to study the book of Acts and you start to study the history of the church because it's like, okay, who was good and who was bad? Because they're coming from James, from Jerusalem, and James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. But there was there, still this element of the, the New Testament Christians holding on to, to the law. Some of them unknowingly, but these Judaizers, even though they may have said that they were connected to James in Jerusalem... They're like teaching a completely different uh, gospel because they're saying that they have to add circumcision to their faith. And really, by this time that Galatians is written, uh, all this has already been dispelled and taken care of in a conference that they had in Jerusalem where James agreed and Peter stood up and spoke and Paul also that we could not they could not hold Gentiles to to that Standard to say that they had to be circumcised in order to be saved because that wasn't the gospel of salvation that God had ultimately provided. Okay, so Paul has actually started these churches and he has preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. But once again, these false brethren have come in and they have perverted the gospel. And what we already covered was that the apostle Paul said, who has bewitched you? The idea is that a spell had been cast upon them that caused them to change their way of thinking and the object of their faith. We've talked about that before, the object of faith from Jesus Christ and him crucified now to a works based performance based type gospel. Many scholars call it Galatianism. We call it legalism. It's a works based Christianity. Now, we, we've already I don't want to exhaust that again, but. So this is right now when we're starting in verse 17, the Apostle Paul is talking about those false brethren. That's what that plural pronoun is, they. He says, they zealously affect you. Now, I got to kind of break it down a little bit because if you read it in a newer translation, it probably would make a little bit more sense. But the word affect can have can mean covet, but it can also be desire. And so depending upon the context that is being used, it can be good or bad. Zealous means to burn with fervor and heat. So what he's saying is, is that these false brethren are burning with fervor and heat because they covet you. They desire you to come with them and basically to turn your back on what it is that I've taught you. He says that he, they want you for themselves, but not well. So they're zealously and fervently desiring and coveting you, but not in a good way. This is, not, this is not good what they're doing. Yes, they would exclude you. As a matter of fact, they're wanting you to go with them. But what they're doing is they're going to cut you off from the, from the eternal gospel if you buy into what it is that they're trying to sell you. They would exclude you that you might affect, once again, the word desire, that you would desire them. They, they want to exclude you. They want to get you to come over, but they want to, to turn your hearts away from me and the gospel that I'm preaching to you and pull you over to them. This is, a, this is a lust of the flesh, and he's going to explain that later on in Galatians 5 whenever we get to that. Called, it's called heresies. Many times people think heresy is just a, a false doctrine. And there is false doctrine connected to it, but the idea of a true heresy is that it creates division. It causes a faction in the church. 
So it's a false doctrine that splits people apart and causes division within the body of Christ. And so this is exactly what they're doing is that they're causing factions through false doctrine. So they would exclude you that you might desire them instead of me. And then he goes on to say, but it is a good thing to be zealously affected. In other words, it's a good thing to have fervor and burn with heat and have a desire for good things. Amen. It's a good thing to burn with heat and fervor and desire for the gospel. It's a good thing to burn with heat and fervor and desire to see souls won into the kingdom, to love the word of God, to desire to want to know the word of God, to desire the presence of God and to know the Lord more intimately. Amen. And not only when I am present with you. And then, he, and then he kind of changes gears a little bit. And he says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Basically he's saying, I wish that I was there with you and then I could change my tone. So he's really, to be truthful, we, I mean, we can call it whatever we want. He's irritated. <laughs> he's got a righteous anger. He's not pleased with the way that they're being bewitched. He's not pleased with what these false brethren are doing and how they're pulling them away. He's in his in this letter, his tone, the way he feels and obviously the way when they read it, it it's not comfortable. You yeah, ever been in a situation where it's it's it, there's a there's there's tension, you know, and we've talked about that before, not to get off on a different subject, but talked about the fact that a lot of times, whether we're right or wrong, whenever people bring correction into our life, we don't like it. Anybody know what I'm talking about regarding that? Whenever there's things going on in your life that the Lord's dealing with you about, then somebody brings correction to your life. And even though you know in your mind, hey, what that person's saying is true, there's something that's not right with me. There's something in my spirit that rises up and gets frustrated and said, did you just correct me? Did you really just do that? How dare you? Take the time to correct me. I mean, I've felt that before. I've shared the story before about my boss and whenever he brought correction into my life. The reason why that's so memorable in my mind is that it was the first time that I really got a revelation that I just didn't like correction. And maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> but I don't think that's true. I do have a little bit of an issue with it if the wrong person corrects me or the wrong person, whatever. You know, we just got to get over ourselves and God can use anybody. Amen. Amen. He used that mute, that donkey in, ba in Balaam's life. Remember that story? The donkey was trying to tell Balaam, don't move forward with your plans. You know, and I mean, if God can use a donkey, he can certainly use somebody else. Amen. Amen. All right. And so anyway, uh, that's what's going on. That he's trying to bring correction and he's taught and he's speaking to them in such a way that they would know that he says, tell me you that desire to be under the law. So he's like, OK, so here you are. This is what you really want. This is what they're telling you. And you're submitting to their false teaching. And this is what you want. OK, so you that want to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? Do you, do you not hear what it's teaching? And really and truly, they would not have known the law like these Judaizers. I'm going to be honest with you. It's easy to come into, and, and I've had to learn this. That's why I go, that's why I like to go verse by verse. That's why I like to preach this way. Don't get me wrong, I'll preach other ways. But I've learned, I've learned through the years, whenever I first, when the first, Lord first got a hold of me and started to show, give me understanding of the scriptures, I'm telling you, there was a time when I could literally almost quote, not the word, not, couldn't quote the whole Bible verse by verse, but I could, I could recall verses of the scripture, bam, 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 whether it was Old Testament, I'm telling you, it was like, it was a supernatural, amazing thing. I was impressed. By myself, I was like, dude, where did this come from? Because it wasn't me. Praise I'm God. telling you, I knew some verses. But you know what? I hate to admit this to you. There, there was times that whenever I would, when I would find in situations people, and I was also beginning to understand the message of the cross, and I would try to share that with people. And when they didn't buy in and they would try to come against it and they knew a little bit of the Bible, I would take all that knowledge and all them scriptures I had, and I would like chop them up, beat them up, like hit them. See what I'm saying? And I realize now that, that uh, how wrong I was for that. And, and so, and I, another thing that I learned was, is that I could get up and I could speak a whole lot of stuff and I could throw out a whole lot of scripture and I could give out a whole lot of information, but it does not mean that the people that were sitting in the audience were really understanding 
what I was trying to communicate. And true communication has to be both ways. It can't just be expressed. It also has to be received. And I learned that. Right? And so I asked God to help me. And so that's why sometimes I like really going verse by verse. And I really like this morning, to, to be perfectly honest with you, this is really why I wanted to do the book of Galatians again, because I love this story. I love this passage of scripture out in the book of Galatians. I did all of it just because I wanted to get to this part right here. You may not like it as much as I do, but but this is this is why I did it. All right, so he says, I desire to be present with you now to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is, hey, it says Agar right there, but it's really saying Hagar. It's just the New Testament way that they spelled it. It doesn't have the H, but it's talking about Hagar, which was, you know, and we're, we're going to explain all of that, which was Abraham and Sarah's uh, slave or servant that lived in their house. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath is an husband. All right, so this is a very confusing passage of Scripture. That's one of the reasons that I love it so much, because it required me to work at it to be able to understand it. And so I desire to be able to teach other people so that they might be able to understand it a little bit better. One thing that used to trip me up and that I want you to be aware of is that Hagar was actually considered a wife of Abraham's because they were allowed to have more than one wife. And according to that custom and according to those laws back then, they were able to have more than one wife. So she was their slave, but whenever they entered into this contract with her to have this child, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more, she was actually considered to be his wife. And so that's really what that text is saying right there when it says, for the desolate, which means Sarah, who's talking about her barren womb, will ultimately will have more children than she which has a husband, which was talking about Hagar right there. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what says the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Amen. Father, I just pray that you would help us all to have understanding of this passage of scripture and that you'd help me to explain it. So the Apostle Paul kind of shifted gears here and he said, I travail. It, 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 the idea was I travail in pain or I'm travailing until Christ is birthed in you. And really the word travail talks about the pains of labor to give birth. So he's using the idea of giving birth as what it is that he's experiencing spiritually as these children that he has brought into the faith are now being, uh, the gospel is being perverted in their minds. And so he introduces the thought himself of this childbirth, but then he transitions into these other two mothers, right? And, you know, to be truthful, I was just going to say that I think it'd be a little bit un easier to understand if we tried to write some of this on the board. But he introduces these two mothers. And in this, in this story, there's, there's actually characters and there's location. And there's, uh, there's also a plot in this allegory. That's what the Apostle Paul said, that, that these two women and their offspring are actually an allegory, right? So it really happened. There truly was a, a, a wife of Abraham named Sarah, and she did give offspring to a young boy named Isaac, amen? And there truly was a, a bondwoman who lived in the house with them who gave birth to Ishmael, but... There's so much spiritual significance intertwined in what really happened in that narrative story that the Apostle Paul uses it as an allegory of the two covenants to explain to the Galatian readers that what's going on in their life is not going to lead to liberty, but instead is going to lead to bondage. And so the characters of the story are obviously Abraham, 
But I just want to kind of focus on, on the wives right now because we have the two wives are Sarah and Hagar. So these are the two women that Abraham has offspring with, and she ends up, they end up giving birth to children, right? And so with Sarah, she gives birth to Isaac, and Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. We're going to kind of talk about the story a little bit to familiarize ourselves, but I want you to know that these also represent the two covenants. According to the story, these women represent the two covenants. And so he's saying that Hagar re is representative of the old covenant and that Sarah is representative of the new covenant. But then within the story, you know, within every plot, there's always a location. There's always a geographical location where the story's taking place. Does that make sense? Well, in this particular situation, not so much where it happened in the Old Testament, but the way that Paul's using it, because it can get kind of confusing, is that there's two places that are talking about. This place here is called Heavenly Jerusalem. And then this place here is actually called Mount Sinai. Now, whenever you begin to read this story on the surface and you don't really try to stop and dissect it, it can become real confusing because we know, because we pay attention to chronology to some extent in this church, that Sarah and Hagar <laughs> take place approximately 2000 BC, correct? I mean, I know you're just kind of taking my word for it, but we, we write, I write this on the board on a pretty regular basis. But whereas the giving of the Old Covenant or here at Mount Sinai took place about 1450 BC, right? And so he's saying that Hagar is representative of Mount Sinai. So Hagar was way before Mount Sinai, but what he's doing is he's just using it as an allegory. And he's saying Hagar is like the old covenant. Sarah is like the new covenant, okay? So that's essentially what's taking place. So in the story, if we go back to Genesis and we talk about the life and the, and the birth of the two children, what we know is, is that Abraham had, uh, you know, had been called by the providence of God. In other words, the word providence just simply means that God has a watchful eye and that he cares. Providence means somebody's watching over you and caring for you. Well, God has a, has a care and a watchful eye for salvation history. I've taught, I, I love that terminology because it talks about the unity of the whole Bible. God has a providential eye and a care and a concern over his plan. And when the time was right, he called this man Abraham out from his father's house and he taught, gave him a promise. Amen. And the Bible, the, the, part of the promise that he told him was, he says that your offspring is going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore of the sea. Now, the Bible says that Abraham believed God, amen, and it was what? What was it? Yeah. Counted yeah. unto him as what? Right. Righteousness, amen. So Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Now, from that, we learn that Abraham is the father of the faith. Long before the law was ever into existence, listen, Abraham believed God first regarding the new covenant. We've talked about that before. God gave a promise to Abraham on the front end. The law came after the new covenant was fulfilled whenever Jesus came. Amen. So Abraham believed God and it was counted up to him as righteousness. And Abraham is the father of the faith. He was the first to believe God regarding the promise of the new covenant as far as the whole promise that was given literally to a man. Amen. And while it's true that he did not know the name of Jesus... Through the process of time, he knew that through him, through Abraham, would come a nation and that through that nation would come a seed. And he knew in some way, shape or form that that seed would ultimately be a sacrifice because God required of him to bring his own son, Isaac, up a hill and to offer him up as a sacrifice. So Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. But many years had passed. Many years had passed after the promise, and Abraham and Sarah began to grow weary in their waiting. 
You know, and there's many times that you and I as Christians will grow weary in our waiting, right? Oh, Lord, I thought that you were going to give me this. I've been living for you for such and such amount of time, and I asked this of you, and I felt like this was your will for my life, and it hasn't come to pass. I'm growing weary in my waiting. We grow weary in well-doing. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Amen. I could use a lot of examples, but I can tell you that there was one time with my own children that one that I can remember thinking to myself, dude, I, I'm not dude. I wouldn't call God dude, but I was thinking to myself, <laughs> God, I'm weary. Every time I come home, I feel like all I do is spank them kids. Because I and they weren't even bad, but I realized, now, dude, I really was strict on my kids. I was. But you know what? I had Sierra tell me one time when she watched somebody else's kids. She said, Daddy, I don't, I'm so glad you spanked me. <laughs> That's right, girl. Keep it straight. But, but you know, there was a, I can't lie. There was a time whenever I got tired. Because then it got to the point where it was like, I'm not only going to spank them for me. If they back talk whenever. And I didn't spank them for everything. All I really did, all I really spanked for was rebellion. Like, in other words, the Lord showed me, and this is a whole other story, and I might have shared this with you before. Your job as a father is to instruct your children what it is that they expect, what you expect from them. If you don't instruct them on what you expect from them, then it's not their fault. It's your fault. You failed them. But once you've instructed them in what it is that you expect from them, if they don't do what it is that you've now instructed them in, it's called rebellion. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Now there is discipline to be dealt with. And so whenever they would rebel against what it was that I told them, I'd put it on. Well, then it got to the situation where while I was gone, they would rebel when I wasn't there. So I'm like, that's fine. I'll just get them when I get home. I'll get them once for me. I'll get them once for you if that's the way it's going to be. Well, so then with time, though, I grew weary and well-doing. And I can remember asking, I didn't think of it that way, but I just was tired. And I just like, am I really doing the right thing? And that's the, what the, the, the word that the Lord gave to me. Don't grow weary in well-doing. If you're doing the right thing, stay on track and don't grow weary in well-doing. But that's what happened to Abraham. The promise had come, the fulfillment had not come, and he grew weary in his waiting. And ultimately, just like we do many times, they, him and Sarah, took matters into their own hands. They took matters into their own hands, and like they did, we also do, try to produce their own promise. But what they produced was, a pro was not the promise. Instead, it was the flesh. And that is what Abraham and Sarah did. When they allowed Hagar to serve as a womb for the birth of what they assumed would be the promised heir. He was not the promised heir. It was never God's plan for Ishmael to be the promised heir. In that culture, once again, this was permitted, and Hagar would have been considered a wife of Abraham. However, as Paul pointed out in the story, she was a slave, whereas Sarah was a free woman. The firstborn of Abraham with Hagar was Ishmael. And it appears, if you read the story in the book of Genesis, that everything was going fine in the family. There wasn't a whole bunch of strife with Ishmael. The Bible doesn't tell us that there was a problem with Ishmael in the early years. Later on, we're told that he's like a wild donkey and that nobody can control him. And he's out of control. Okay, but in the early formative years, there's no story that there's a problem with Ishmael. It's not until Isaac shows up on the scene. As a matter of fact, if you go back and you read chapter 21 of Genesis, what you'll find out is that it's when Isaac was weaned. So there comes a time frame whenever the child is weaned from the breast. And it's time, it means he's growing up. He's maturing. And now it's time for him to eat some real food. But now he's, he's coming of age. And the idea was, was that as he became older and he started to mature, Ishmael started to realize what was going on. And he started to realize in his own mind and his own heart, hey, I'm not the heir. This little boy right here is the heir. Now, we can't have proof of this from the scripture because it's not there. But according to Josephus, who was a Jewish historian uh, and was a lot closer in time to this story than what we are, the idea behind it is, is that as the boy grew older, Isaac, Ishmael would shoot arrows and tell Isaac to go fetch the arrows. And all of a sudden, the arrows seemingly became closer and closer to Isaac and Sarah saw what was happening. So that's the story behind it. Once again, we can't prove that, but that's the tradition of what of what is believed. But there was just a level of persecution that was taking place. Ishmael hated the, the, the child Isaac, the promised child, and wanted to destroy him and essentially kill him. 
And so he began to persecute, threaten the young boy. And her response, Sarah, when she saw this taking place, was that Hagar and the boy had to go. And truth be told, God agreed with Sarah. God agreed with Sarah and he told Abraham that she was right. Indeed, Hagar and the lad had to go. While Abraham obeyed God, it was very grievous for him to do so. The word grievous there in the Hebrew means literally anger, sadness, or displeasure. Abraham let it go, let them go, did what Sarah asked because God had reiterated that that was the right thing, but it didn't feel good to him. He, he wasn't pleased with it at all. It actually angered him. It saddened him, but, 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 he, went, but he went ahead and he obeyed, he obeyed the Lord anyway. The reason that it saddened him and it displeased him was because that he loved Ishmael. He loved Ishmael, and, and, but, and not only that, it was something that he had done. It was something that he had produced. And we don't like to admit this sometimes, but the truth is, is that, once again, we like it when we do stuff that seems like it's the right thing. Right. We want, matter of fact, I mean, I don't know if you've ever noticed people like that, but boy, people will talk about this. I hope y'all probably think that about me, too. At least people have told me before, dude, that's you, you know, and this, well, it's just true in all of us. But I, I don't like to think of myself that way. And if I am, I, I really, I guess that kind of, that's grievous to me to hear that. But have you ever talked to people before and all they do is talk about their own self? And no matter what you talk about, they got something, they're going to trump you. They got something better. And I'm just like, dude, really? Come on, man. You know, you know, I don't know. I went and preached in Mexico. Yeah, well, I preached in Mexico, South America. And, you know, it's always something, you know. And, okay, it's, that's, that's all good. But, but the truth is, is that whenever we have done something and we feel like a sense of accomplishment connected to it, it, it it's hard for us to let it go. And that's why works-based Christianity is a hard thing for people to let go of. Whenever they have recognized, you know, that they have done all this work and that they knew the scriptures better than other people because they spent all this time studying and they had all these scriptures memorized and they had been in ministry for all these years. And now whenever you, whenever you explain to them, yeah, but none of that gets you closer. I mean, yes, it can be a process of, of you seeking the face of God if your motives are right. But when you look to that, and you feel accomplishment through that, there's something wrong with the motives of your heart. Hallelujah. That's not the way that it's, that it's supposed to be. But, so it was grievous for Abraham. It was something that he had grown accustomed to. He, he was accustomed to having Hagar and Ishmael around. Okay, And so he didn't want to let him go. He loved Isaac very much. He just, he just loved them both. He, he, he didn't want to get, he, he loved Ishmael and Isaac. He, he didn't want to let him, he, he just wanted to keep them both there. Right? And to, and to continue to live that way. Without knowing it, this is a trap specifically. Now, this could be many things. This could be our worldliness. As the Christian tries to hold on a little bit of the world along with a little bit of the church. Right? It, it becomes, we, we, we want to try to hold on to both of them at the same time instead of just cutting it off and separating from it. Right? But at the same time, specifically speaking, this is talking about the trick, this what we're talking about this doctrine or the idea of a purity of doctrine that holds to faith in Christ and him crucified and rejects the notion that I can please God through my performance and what it is that I do. Within mankind, oftentimes Christians are taught it's a trap. I put that in my note. It's a trap that many times Christians are taught in the new Testament that they hold, that they hold on to both. In other words, they get saved through faith in Christ, that's the big point, for conversion, you get saved through what Jesus did at the cross, but now in order to grow up, you, you, there's things you have to do. There's works that you have to do. And please don't misunderstand me. You, if you don't ever read the Bible, you'll never grow up. If you don't ever spend time with the Lord, you'll never grow up. If you don't ever go to church, it's unlikely. I mean, I guess you could watch people on TV grow. But you know what? Part of coming to church, can I tell you a secret? And this is one thing that, that my old pastor Brad Bullock used to say, let me tell you. He, in my opinion, he was spot on on this deal. He said, one of the reasons that you come to church is because the church is a family. Amen. Now, you may not, but so now my next question is, do you, how, how many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you really, really love your family? 
<laughs> I mean, I know you love your kids, but I'm just trying to say, like, you know, the ones, there's always somebody in your family that kind of rubs you the wrong way. You, right? You know what I'm talking about. And even though you love your kids, sometimes they rub you the wrong way, too. Get on your nerves. There ain't nobody that can aggravate you more than your family. There's nobody that knows how to get to you more than your family. They don't know how to press buttons, and nobody else knows how to press. Right? Well, I got good news for you, or bad news, however you want to look at it. When you come to church, if it's a family, trust me, you're going to get some buttons pressed, bro. And that's the problem. A lot of times, people would rather sit in their jammies and watch Brother Swagger on television. Okay, but guess what? Oh, come on, Bridget. I'm calling you out, sister. <laughs> all right? Listen, but if you sit over there and do all your, your jammies and you watch Brother Swagger, then you ain't never around your family. But if you're around your family, you're going to get poked in the eye, you're going to get your toes stepped on every now and then, and you're going to get irritated and frustrated, and guess what's going to end up happening? You're going to have to learn how to work through by faith in Christ to receive grace to get through that situation. Amen. I'm telling you right now, each and every one of us in this room have rough, have roughened edges. Every last one of us in this room have things in our life that the Lord isn't pleased with. And if we run from the, from the family of God, from the house of God, then we're just thwarting or retarding, if you will, our growth. Uh, because God uses a mixture. Young and Cole, can you turn, turn that up a little bit? Troy, for me, would you mind doing that? This 70 event, would you hit, put it up to about 70 over there? We, uh, there's things in our life and, and God uses a mixture, if you call it a gumbo, of trials along with grace. Whenever there's things in your life that are frustrating to you, right? There's a lot of different ways you can handle them. Some people, we oftentimes we fuss and complain. Right? We find other people to fuss and complain to. Lord knows I'm guilty. But ultimately, when it's all said and done, and I'm not even saying that it's always bad to fuss and complain, but then again, it probably is. But when it's all said and done, none of that's going to fix it. I was having a conversation with somebody this morning, and that, that, that particular person was saying, hey, you know what? I'm learning how not to, not to respond to these situations. Yes. Because when I respond to these situations, it doesn't fix anything, right? In other words, I got to give it to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Give it to the Lord. Let the Lord do the work <laughs> and on the inside of our hearts. All right. So, but that's, but, but we're going back to the idea that there's a trap that wants us to hold on to both. And, and in New Testament Christianity, you can't hold on to legalism, law, works-based Christianity and grace through faith at the same time. They, we, people attempt to live for him through works and human effort instead of through faith and grace. So that's basically the background context of the story between Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac. All right. So point number one has to do with the women, the women in the covenants. The first characters in the story. And Sarah was the first wife. She was the promise. <coughs> which is the promise of the new covenant of grace. God told Abraham, the seed is not coming from her. The seed is not Ishmael. I've had multiple conversations with Muslims and I've tried to tell them that. And I look, I got to the point where I'm just going to tell them, you know, oh, no, we don't believe in the same God. And I've told them that before. Look, one of us is wrong. That same thing I tell the Jehovah's Witnesses, same thing I tell the Mormons, same thing I tell the Muslims. One of us is wrong. The Buddhists, whoever I'm talking to, I'm gonna, that's, how I, that's how I break in. That's my icebreaker. One of us is wrong. That's right. We ain't both right. Amen. And whenever you get down to it, it's like it ain't the same God. And, and whenever I ask one of them, I'm like, hey, did you, do you read the Old Testament? Because I'm, I'm under the impression the Koran has the Old Testament in it. And whenever they say, yeah, I said, well, did you read in this book right here where it says right here, Isaac will be the heir. Not Ishmael. Ishmael's not the heir. Isaac right. is the heir. And that's what the word of God says. So it wasn't going to come from Hagar. It was going to come from Sarah. She was the first wife. The promise was connected to her and the offspring that she would have. Many times whenever people view the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, all they think about is the law. For so long, I don't know if you, can you remember a time before maybe you came to this church and you really thought about time frames and chronology and all that stuff and your viewpoint on the Old Testament, if you had a viewpoint on the Old Testament. 
how many times when you when you thought about the Old Testament, you just automatically connected it to the law. Maybe you didn't do that, but I did. Okay, for the longest time, that's all I ever thought about because I didn't really know much about the Old Testament, really, when I first got saved. And so whenever I would think about the Old Testament, it was just, oh yeah, that was the law. All right, but what we what we fail to understand and realize is that there's a long history of God dealing with humanity before the law was ever in existence. And whenever God was dealing, see, most of the time, and you'll hear many preachers talk about this, and for a long time, it took me quite some time to get my thinking and my brain out of this rut that I had been placed into, that there was no grace in the Old Testament, and that's foolishness. God's constantly dealing with mankind with, through grace in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, before the law was ever in existence, God was all the time dealing with mankind with grace. Right. And, and so that was there's a long history of God dealing with man before there was an Israel, before it even given the law. And during that time frame, once again, he dealt with grace. Now, when I talk about grace in this situation, I'm talking about this is the definition I'm using. God's unmerited favor. Very seldom do you actually even hear me use that definition. Right. I mean, anybody that's been around the kind of teaching that I do. For, for any length of time is more used to the definition that I use <coughs> that talks about a divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the light. Y'all heard me say that one before, right? Well, this one here is related to conversion and this one here is related to sanctification, all right? God's unmerited favor. Essentially, the idea is, is that man doesn't deserve God's kindness. Man can't work hard enough to earn God's kindness, but because God is love, he puts his love and his kindness, his mercy, his grace, unmerited favor that God gives to man. He gives his love to undeserving man. God began with grace in the garden. After the fall of Adam and Eve, he provided an offering of sacrifice. That was a perfect picture of grace right there. God gave grace in the garden when he provided the sacrifice because Adam and Eve were guilty and undeserving. But rather than requiring their death immediately for their offense, he allowed the death of another to pay the price for them. Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. But I'm going to give you grace right here. And I'm going to allow something else to die in your place. And again, when he approached Abraham, it was through grace. He approached Abraham through grace. But then, listen, whenever he, when he made the, the, the covenant with Abraham, I'm pretty sure it's chapter 15. I'm kind of shooting from the hip. When he made the covenant with Abraham, remember the story? I know I say it a lot to you. Abraham was asleep. When God had Abraham cut the carcasses of those animals and put them to the side, and then Abraham fell asleep under the tree, and God walked through. It was grace. Because God was not going to allow Abraham to get any of the credit. Because the Bible says that because God could find no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. God was the one that cut the covenant. Amen. It was grace. Uh, when God delivered Israel from Egypt on that Passover night, it was through grace, not law, because the law had not even been given yet. God's unmerited favor. His people were slaves in Egypt. He reached out to them, he poured grace upon them, and he freed them and gave them liberty. Amen? Yes, God has been gracious and kind through the ages. He's been long-suffering with humanity and long-suffering with us. I love that scripture. You can go to it, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Because it's talking about the graciousness of God. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. The idea of slack there is lazy. God's not slow or lazy. You know any lazy people? <laughs> God's not, sl not slow or lazy concerning his promise as some people can think of that. Because the, the idea could be that way. Oh man, God is so slow in all this. He just don't want to get up off the couch and actually do what he said he was going to do. <laughs> I mean, this stuff been going on forever. When's he going to move? That's what mankind would think. And so they'll start to scoff. Part of the scriptures talks about that. We're not going to go back to it. But in the last days, there will be scoffers. And they start making fun. Because they believe that the Lord 
isn't moving as rapidly as what they want him to move. But God's not slack. He's not lazy. God's very industrious, as a matter of fact. God's always moving and operating and accomplishing things on multiple levels that we can't even imagine or see. But the reason that it appears that way is because he's long-suffering. He's gracious, he's kind, he's loving, and he's long-suffering. What does it mean to be long-suffering? He's waiting. He's having patience with you and me. He's having patience with the unrepentant sinner. He's having patience with the one who has not given her heart to him yet. He's waiting patiently so that he can pour out his unmerited favor on another soul. Amen? If we were more like him. Praise God. If we were just a little bit more long-suffering like the Lord. Patience in relationships. I don't know about you, but I struggle with that. I still struggle with that. I mean, I've gotten so much better. I've gotten better to where I can release and let, and, 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 and let go and forgive. You know what I'm saying? But if you, really, if you really do, I can't lie. If you really do me, if I can't trust you, dude, it changes something in me. And I, I need the Lord to help me with, with that, I guess. I mean, I don't want to get people that I can't trust too close to me. But, but you get the point. Is that I, we have a hard time sometimes to, tr to truly be patient in relationships with people, right? But that's not that's not the, the nature of the Lord. The Lord's gracious and kind and long suffering. So that was the first that was the first wife. That was Sarah. She represents the new covenant. She represents grace. God's been dealing with humanity and grace. But the second wife was Hagar. She was the flesh, and like the law, she was added after the promise. So the promise was given, but whenever it tarried and they grew weary and waiting, that's whenever Hagar was added. So you see, this is part of the analogy that, or the allegory that Paul is that Paul is using. She was added after the promise was given to Abraham. Even though she was legally considered his wife according to the laws of that time, she was still a slave. And in this sense, she had a purpose, but as we've already discussed, the law was a temporary purpose. It was never intended that she would give birth to the eternal heir. The law was never intended to replace the new covenant. The law could serve as a mirror and a monitor. We've talked about this a little bit in this series. Romans chapter 3 verse 20. If you put that up there real quick. It served as a mirror in the sense that it gives us knowledge of sin. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law will reveal sin to the heart of man. When you read, when you read what the law of God says is transgression of him, it reveals to the heart of man sin. I don't know how well it really worked, but I know that there was Kirk Cameron. If you I mean I'm kind of old, but they used to have a show called Growing Pains, if you've ever heard of Kirk Cameron. And he grew up on that show. Well, he was a Christian. And he connected himself to this other guy, Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort. And so Ray Comfort came up with this process where he would witness to people. And you could call Kirk Cameron up and he'd say, hey, he'd say, hey, Kirk, would you come down here to Bourbon Street? And we're going to witness to people. And they'd show up. You know, I mean, can't say that they always did, but for a while there, they, they'd show up. And basically, that's what they would do. They would use the law as an icebreaker to try to talk to somebody. They would say, hey, do you, do you, what, you know, what do you think about Jesus? What, do, you, do you feel like, oh, man, I'm, do you, are you saved? Are you okay with God? And they'd be like, man, I'm, I'm fine. But what makes you think that you're okay with God? Well, I mean, I'm a good person, dude. I pay my taxes. Never cheated on my wife. I never killed anybody. You know, I'm a, I'm a good guy. And so then he, they would take the list of the law and they would start going through it. And they say, well, okay, so you say you never cheated on your taxes or then they, they would say to some people some people wouldn't say they never cheated on their taxes because most people have a lot of people have cheated on their taxes and so that was one of the ones they would say oh so you say you never you, you never broke any of the commandments but but have you ever cheated on your taxes mm -hmm. you know and they kind of get kind of a little bit quiet so that means you stole them before and so basically what i'm trying to say is is that they would use the law to expose sin in people and then they would explain hey the Bible teaches that if any if any of the law is broken, then you're guilty of the whole thing, right? And then they would then they would take that opportunity to preach Jesus. So it serves as a mirror in the sense that it reveals to mankind what, what it is in his life 
and where it is that he's transgressed. And it serves as a monitor. We talked about this in Galatians 3, 23 through 25, because it monitors the behavior and it shows mankind where to go, where not to go. And it ultimately brings man to Jesus. And that's what it said right here. It said, but before faith came, in other words, before Jesus came, the new covenant, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. So we were kept protected. But at the same time, that's what the law does. It will lead people to Jesus. He says, for wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. It provides a, a, a boundaries. <laughs> But ultimately, when, it, when the knowledge of sin is given through the law and man now realizes that he's transgressed God and he attempts to live for God through just a set of rules and regulations and he can't accomplish it, then what it ends up doing is it ends up bringing him to Jesus because he realizes that in and of his own strength, he can't do it. Amen. So the law acts like a monitor, keeps men's behavior in check, but also leads them to Jesus. So a mirror, yes, a monitor, yes, but not a mother. The law was never intended to be a mother. It was never intended to, to, give, to, to give birth to the heir because God's plan was life and righteousness and the law could give neither. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid for if there had been a law, which a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So it couldn't give, it couldn't give life. It couldn't give righteousness. That's Galatians 2.21, righteousness. In Galatians 2.21, it says, I do not frustrate. Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That's the mothers that we were talking about. One is grace, one is law. But you know, one of the things that I would like to say is that when it talks about life and righteousness, I know that I've said this before when I've taught, but I don't know that I can get the point across hard enough that really and truly, this is a pivot point right here. Righteousness, Because you know what? It ultimately leads to life. Without this right here, there's no access to God. Whenever you look at New Testament Christianity, when you look at New Testament, it all hinges on righteousness. Because it's all righteousness, the gift of Jesus' righteousness that was given to mankind because of his sacrifice on the cross and our response of faith. And the, and the exchange that took place where he took our guilt upon him, amen, and in response, he gave us the gift of righteousness given by Jesus. Now we've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And because of that, we now have access to the presence of God. We have access into eternal life. But without righteousness, none of this exists. When you look at the gift of God, it all hinges on this exchange that took place that made man righteous. That's why it's such a dangerous place to be when man feels as though he can perform and gain his own righteousness. If you asked someone who was caught up in works, they would never probably respond that way. If, if you asked them and said, Do, are you trying to earn your righteousness? They would say, no, of course not. But the motives of their heart were actually contrary to what they said, and they just didn't realize that they were actually putting their faith in what they were doing rather than in what Christ had already done. That's self-righteousness. That's not the righteousness of God, right? We, we, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 says, now the righteousness of God has been revealed. That's talking about Jesus. Jesus was manifest, amen? All right. That was the mothers, now, now the children, the first and second births. <clears throat> the first birth produced by, was produced by the flesh, and the first birth loves its flesh. Many times, uh, for the longest time, I thought the works of the flesh, or I thought walking after the flesh, just meant that I woke up in a, on the wrong side of the bed, 
I was aggravated. I don't really have a dog, but if I would have had one, I would have kicked it pretty hard. I probably said a few cuss words, and I was just real aggravated and yelled at people, and I was just mad. And I thought that that was what it meant to follow after the flesh. But those are really the fruits of the flesh. That's the result of flesh. When you're following after the flesh, your faith is in the wrong thing. Your faith is in your own performance. Your trust is in what you do. It leads to failure. Failure causes frustration. You frustrate the grace of God. Now, next thing you know, you start producing less in the flesh. So the first birth is of the flesh, and, it, and the flesh loves its flesh. The first birth in Adam is a physical birth that is produced through the work of man. In other words, a man and a woman come together, and the result of the natural order is that offspring is produced. But the natural birth is the first birth, and the birth that matters is the one that comes from God. Amen? And just as the first birth of Ishmael was the work of Abraham and Sarah, and was a work that was natural and physical and of the flesh, is through this first birth, physical birth that we were born like Adam and received our sinful nature. So in this covenant story, in this allegory story, Hagar is the bondwoman that gives that produces a child of the flesh that is that is synonymous if you will with bondage and also synonymous with the original birth of Adam. Okay, it's the, that is the root in us that drives or compels us towards fleshly desires. Even though we're in trouble before we are saved, many times we don't even really know how much trouble we're in. Because we just all we've known is living in the flesh. All we've known is living our sinful lifestyles, right? But once we are saved, the old man really tries to entice us towards sin and our behavior. And in a similar sense, Ishmael didn't cause problems in the house, like I said earlier, until Isaac was born. And once Isaac was born, Ishmael sensed the threat and began to ridicule or persecute Isaac. And in a similar fashion, once we're saved, Satan That's uses good. the desires of the old man, right, That's to good. try and bring death to our new man. Amen. There's a persecution. The flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. Paul will tell us that later on in the book of Galatians. The flesh and the, the flesh lusts against the spirit, spirit lusts against the flesh. The two are contrary to one another, and you cannot do what it was that you wanted. Try to hold on to both. The second birth is Isaac. Look at John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. John is saying that as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. A supernatural birth, born again, the plan of God. The, this birth represents our conversion. His birth, Isaac, was a supernatural birth that couldn't be produced by the hands of man. Abraham and Sarah couldn't concoct this story in their tent. They couldn't scheme and manipulate and plan this situation out. All vigor had gone out the door. He was 99, she was 90, her womb was barren and he didn't have nothing left. But God supernaturally intervened. And that's the thing about conversion. It's a supernatural. And I, I don't, I, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. I mean, if you're saved, you know as well as I do. But whenever you're in a conversation with someone and you're trying to describe to them what conversion is really all about, if they've never been converted, they don't really know. Amen. Because they've never experienced it on the inside. But when you have experienced true conversion, you know that it happens. That's right. And then we can have people on the outside view us and judge us all day long. Oh, well, I saw how you treated this one, and I see how you act over here doing this, and I don't like this part about your life, and we can even do that to ourselves in here. But let me tell you something. If you are saved and the Holy Ghost lives in your heart, you ain't the same today that you were yesterday. God's doing a work in your life, and he's going to continue. So this birth represents our conversion. It's supernatural. It was all the work of God. Amen. It's a supernatural miracle that cannot really be explained. I use this scripture a lot, but it's Ephesians 1.13 because it describes the, the earnest or the down payment of the Holy Spirit. There's coming a day when our whole body is going to be redeemed from this earth. We're going to receive our glorification. Hallelujah. Amen. That's going to be a good day. Praise God. But this is the down payment. This is how I know that you know that you're saved. Not because you said so. Not because you raised your hand in church one time and you prayed a prayer at vacation Bible school when you were seven years old. I mean, I'm not saying that's not good. I mean, if you raised your hand and you responded to the gospel, that could definitely be a seed that was planted in your heart. But just, 
And I, and I know what the gospel says. It says that if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. But we had a whole lot of people recite prayers that really weren't converted. That's right. It's not my job to decide who's converted and who's not. Got a lot of people that probably look at me and say, dude, are you converted? <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, is that when you give your life to the Lord and you mean business with God, the, the earnest of the spirit comes on the inside and it changes you. That's what it says. In whom you also trusted Jesus, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after you believed, you heard, you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Hallelujah. It's an earnest, he goes on to say. Of, it's a down payment, amen, of that which is to come. One of the things that we need in a conversion is instantaneous. You will never be any more saved than you are today. If you are saved, you're as saved as you will ever be. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. Amen. Amen? You don't need to delay. You don't need to wait. Millions are in the valley of decision. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Right now, where you are, sitting in that chair, close your eyes if you're not saved. You say, Jesus, I need you. I don't even understand it all, but I come into my heart and save me. I believe you died. I want to believe, I want to believe what your word says. Save me. Let the Holy Spirit do the work in your heart. Conversion is instantaneous, like I said, and you will never be any more saved than what you are today. That's why justification by faith is so important and so necessary for the Christian to understand. Because the devil will try everything in his power to convince you that you are not okay with God. That you, if you fail God, that you're not okay with God. Conversion is also a process. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 21, verse 8, you don't necessarily have to go there, that the child was weaned. That's describing a process of maturity. Isaac was weaned. As Isaac was weaned off milk and moved towards real food, the faith of the Christian is often illustrated through the concept of human growth. As newborn babes desire the sincere, this is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. <clears throat> you know, back in the day, and I still have a lot of grandmas that tell their daughters and whatever, or sons to do it. Just give that baby some, some rice cereal. Some, they, I think my dad used to call, they said that they used to call it pablin. Give that baby some pablin. Put some meat on their bones. Well, you're really not supposed to give pablin or rice cereal until the baby's about four to six months old. The reason why is, is, don't get me wrong, it has caloric value to it. As a matter of fact, you can't really get much higher calories than you mixing milk and cereal together. It's about the highest calories a baby can take. So you can fatten a baby up with cereal and milk, but it can't be broken down for proper nutrition. See, the, the body's not really ready to digest cereal till they hit about four to six months old because of this enzyme in the mouth called salivary amylase that starts to break down carbohydrates. So nutritionally, they can't really utilize it. You can give them calories, they'll fatten up. But when all the, all the nutrients that they need for their brain growth and development to grow up, to mature properly, and to be able to develop properly is actually still in the milk. They need all the fats. They need the amino acids. They need the, pro the protein. You see what I'm saying? And they're not really ready. So they have enzymes in their stomach to break down the proteins and to deal with the fats, but they can't deal with the carbohydrates. And, and so just as a baby needs milk in order to mature and to develop appropriately, the Christian needs the word of God. Desire the pure milk of the word. Amen. The word of God is to the Christian what milk is to the baby. And it's required for growth and maturity. But grow, look at 2 Peter 3.18. He says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, to him be, both, be glory both now and forever. Growing in grace and knowledge. Amen. The word of God like milk giving us an understanding of grace. Growing in the knowledge of the Lord. As we feed on the word like a baby feeds on milk, we begin to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Amen. I got to finish this message because I'm not going to see you for a little while. So this is point number three. I'm going to hurry it up. I know I've really kind of extended my time, but I'll try to finish in the next four minutes. Two types of offspring. Right? We had two mamas. We had two children. But it's not really the same when I say two types of offspring. It results... And different, different, 
it, it's affected the children, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah, we have one that was birth, birth of law, one that's, but, but it's affected them. It, it, it affects their way of life. It affects their standing, if you will. And so what we must understand is that the two mothers give birth to two types of children. A child that is born of a slave is a slave, and a child that is born of a free woman is a free woman, according to the analogy. So birth number one is bondage. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 24. It says, Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage. Hagar is Mount Sinai, which gives birth. That's what the word gendereth means. Gives birth to bondage. Let's look at Romans chapter 7, verse 23 real quick. The Apostle Paul knew this all too well because of his own life. In Romans chapter 7, verse 23, this is what the Apostle Paul says. I love, I love this passage of Scripture. It's kind of deep, but he says, I see another law in my members. His members is his body parts. He said, I see another law in my members, my body parts. And he says, it's at war against the law of my mind. If you read the whole chapter, he's ex he explains that he understands that the law isn't the problem. The law is actually good because it came from God. He was the problem. He was born in sin. He was born with sin. So therefore, when he attempts to live for God through both grace and law, it causes something to revive on the inside of him. That's right. That's why rules-based Christianity, sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, sometimes you'll see major lust of the flesh in people's lives, that even though they're hiding it, because of the fact that they're living under law. It doesn't mean that that's the only way that it can happen, but what I'm saying is, many times this is going on because they're trying to live according to a set of rules, but in the midst of their failure, it just worsens and worsens. So he says, there's a law in his members. There's... He said, I guarantee you that every time this happens, it's already in my body parts. And he says, and it's at war against the law of my mind. In other words, I know the law is good. I know what the law is telling me. It's a mirror. It tells me, it gives me the knowledge of sin. It's a monitor. It tells me where to go and where not to go. But it's at war and it's bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Amen. So even though I know what's right and I know what's wrong, when I try to engage the Lord through this law-based Christianity, when I add law to my grace, it causes an increase. It's almost like throwing gas on an ember. It causes a flare to come up. And it allows the power of sin to gain life again on the inside of me. Amen. And that's what the Apostle Paul was trying to say. So that's what, that's what Hagar is. Hagar gives birth to bondage. When a person tries to hold on to both law and grace at the same time, rules and grace at the same time, listen, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, I want to try to read three chapters of the Bible today because I need to learn more about the Lord. But whenever I say, man, I failed God again yesterday and I didn't even get one chapter in, so today I'm going to get in four and maybe now God's going to be pleased with me. Wrong motive. You're entering into legalism. You're entering into Galatianism. It might not be circumcision, but it's the same thing. Yeah. You're putting your faith in your performance rather than the performance of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you and show you right from wrong. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. The Apostle Paul knew the dangers of this. And we've talked about these scriptures before, but the law actually fuels sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. You try to approach God through law, you give strength to sin. And I can't get it any more clear than that. But this is birth number two. It results in freedom. Looking back at, we're going back to Galatians 4, verse 26. And then we're going to go to Hebrews 12, 22. Galatians 4, 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now go to Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. The reason I want to bring you to Hebrews is because I wanted you to see that on multiple occasions, God uses this terminology here, heavenly Jerusalem. He's describing heaven. There's a Jerusalem on earth. If you'll remember in the text that we were reading... The Apostle Paul said, 
One was Hagar, which is Mount Sinai, gender, it gendereth to bondage, which is basically current Jerusalem. What he was trying to say was, is that them old boys that came over here from Jerusalem with them laws that they tried to put on you. This, this is like Hagar. She was a bond, she was a bond woman, and she, she's connected to the law. And that current Jerusalem that's trying to put these laws on you is putting you in bondage and giving birth to bondage babies versus the heavenly Jerusalem is the one that comes from God and is where the plan of God comes from. That's what he says right here, Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. But you are coming to Mount Zion unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn. Basically, I just wanted to bring you there to show you that when God's talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, and in this sense, he's talking about this is where the plan came from. Right. This is the difference. The promise was given to Abraham through Sarah that gave birth to a promised seed named Isaac. And through that promised seed, there's a spiritual renovation that takes place. God's plan is supernatural, amen, and it breaks through bondages and it, and it results in liberty because it's connected to the spirit of God. Versus what these other people are, are, are offering you comes from man-made ideas, man-made performance, and it's going to result in bondage, and it's not going to give freedom. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, 17. We're closing. It says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about right here in Corinthians 2. He was talking about the reading of Moses. He was saying the reading, whenever people still read Moses today, the people that aren't saved, there's a veil that's over their eyes. They can't see Jesus in the scripture. But when that veil is lifted, where the spirit of the Lord is, God is that spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. He begins to open the eyes. He begins to, he begins to make mankind aware of what the truth of the gospel is. And at the same time, it's a heavenly Jerusalem, Holy Spirit moving in the midst of the life of the believer and accomplishing that thing on the inside of him that he himself cannot do. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. The believer is given access to the grace of God through what Jesus has already done. Amen. So you see the allegory. I hope you can see it. That one results in bondage. She gives birth to bondage babies. The other one gives birth to babies that are free.